kind of gave myself away what I'm about to say. Well, good morning, Grace Life. I just want to say that this just came to mind that it really is an encouraging thing to see to see you guys this morning, um, to see many of your faces that you just faithfully come. The Lord keeps you. And I see you every Lord today, and that's just, don't take that for granted, church. That's a subtle reminder of God's grace in our life, uh, His mercy and His love towards us, that He brings us here every Lord today. He keeps us in the faith. He keeps us from wandering off and going astray all by his mercy and his love and his grace towards us in Christ. So I'd like to say happy Mother's Day to the moms. Um, I just have a few announcements I want to begin uh, by making this morning. I won't be long. So May 22nd, that's not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, we'll be having a picnic style fellowship meal at the park. And then the Saturday before that Sunday, May 21st, Men will be resuming uh, our monthly men's meeting and we'll be covering Joel Beakey's short work on how should men lead their families. Again, it's how should men lead their families. And if you didn't get a copy of the book, um, we might have some extra copies left. Just reach out to possibly Pastor Phil and we will get you a copy. It's a short read. You could read it literally in a day, uh, probably less than 45 minutes. Just find a quiet place and read it. Uh, men who have families, I encourage you to read it and to attend the men's meeting because um, that will be a helpful time for you. Uh, there's no greater responsibility that God has given to you uh, as husbands and fathers than that of leading your family. Um, and if you're not a husband or a father, I encourage you to be a part of that, because like Phil says, it's definitely not the norm that many of you will remain single throughout your entire Christian life. And so if you're planning on being married, if you're planning on being a father one day, attend that. Um, one, because it'll prepare you for that moment, and two, you'll also be able to edify and encourage me to be faithful in my responsibilities to my wife and my kids. Um, so the ladies' fellowship will be May 19th at um, Sister Salji's house. Um, she'll be hosting that in her home. So if you have any questions about that, reach out to her. And then finally, I just want to give us another reminder that we will be doing uh, the Grace Life Family Camp again this year. And that'll be August 23rd through the 26th at New Life Ranch. So if you'd like more information about that, uh, reach out to Pastor Phil and he can help you with any questions that you might have. So, for our time of confession and prayer this morning, uh, I just want to encourage the mothers in the church. Um, I don't really have a particular verse that I, that I, I want to read, um, but I will look at a couple of verses in the Bible and uh, read them, make a couple of comments, hopefully encourage you moms, uh, and then we will pray together as a church. So the first one I have in mind is obviously Proverbs 31, the virtuous wife, the virtuous woman, and uh, I just want you to see how God sees mothers. I want you to view um, your responsibility, your role as a mom, as God sees it, or how God defines it. I know that um, the culture that we currently live in belittles women. Um, the idea that a woman would be a homemaker, that she would uh, raise children and just be a faithful wife, is looked at as something from the Dark Ages. Uh, oppression is what they would like to say, that it's oppression, uh, that it's not truly living, and that you need to be liberated, right? You need to be liberated. You need to become more like a man, uh, which is 
Ironic that the culture would try to lecture us about what motherhood is when they can't even define what a woman is. It's uh, quite ironic and uh, screams Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32 all over it. So, Proverbs 31 it says this. I won't read the whole Proverbs, or the whole proverb, but... I like this. Let's see. We'll just start. Actually, we'll start in verse 10. We'll read a portion of it. So who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When she sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall, she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Verse 27, she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. So, just a couple of comments. I don't think I need to exhort many of the women, the mothers in the church to be like the Proverbs 31 woman right now. When I look around Grace Life, I see many women who excel in these things, these attributes. And when my wife gives testimony, she's more intimate with y'all than I am, I hear these things. And what I just want to briefly do is encourage you that it's no little thing Mothers, it's no little thing in the eyes of God all that you do on a daily basis. I'll tell you this, when my wife does these things, it doesn't go unnoticed by me. In fact, there's many things that I wouldn't be able to do for Grace Life if it wasn't for Whitney. I'm thankful for her. And it's the same with many of you brothers within the church. Women, it's no little thing. The, the culture would like, again, to belittle what you're doing as it's, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Raising children? Being a faithful wife? What are you doing? What is that? That's nothing. You need to leave that behind. Send your kids off for someone else to care for them. Um, get a job. Build a career. That's truly life. Well, that's what the world thinks. But what does God think? We just read it in Proverbs 31. God sees what you're doing and He says it's, it's virtuous. The Lord, the Lord would have your children call you blessed. Your husband call you blessed for what you do. So I just wanted to encourage you in that. Uh, it's no little thing, moms. And uh, for our time of confession and prayer, the prayer part, what I want to do as a church is men who have wives and, and, and single men I want us to examine ourselves and ask the question, do we truly view the mothers within the church, all that they do, the way that God describes them in His Word? Do we think that highly of them? 
And if not, then that would be a good thing to pray to the Lord about, confess and repent. The other thing is, do we pray for the mothers within the church? For the mothers. Do you, do you actively pray for not just your own wife, but all the mothers within the church? Because they have a very important task along with the men. But as the men go off to work, as the men are away, the mothers have been charged with the task to raise the children, to disciple, to teach, to train. We see this in 2 Timothy, even though Timothy didn't have a believing father, what stands out? His mother and his grandmother taught him the sacred scriptures. They trained him in the word of God. And Paul exhorts him not to depart away from what he learned from his mother and his grandmother, but to remain in it, to be steadfast. Um, what does it say in the Proverbs? Son, don't forsake your mother's wisdom. It's like a garland for you. Don't forsake it. And so we can pray that we would have a greater understanding, a greater appreciation of the moms in our own lives, uh, the moms within the church. And then we can also um, confess that we don't actively pray for the mothers within the church and the work that the Lord's given to them. They 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 have a very important work. They are rearing up the next generation if you really think about it in that way. And fathers, they're not to do that alone. You are to lead your family. But there is that reality for many of us who work outside the home that the mom spends eight to ten hours a day with the children, keeping the home, raising them, teaching them, disciplining them. What an important work they have. And so, church, may we collectively rejoice and thank God for moms, and may we pray actively for the moms, ask that God would give them a greater measure of grace within their life to be faithful in all that He has given to them. So let's go before the Lord quietly, and let's pray. Father, we come before you um, this Lord's Day, and, and Mother's Day happens to fall on this Sunday, Lord. Um, God, it's a reminder of the women, the moms that you have blessed us with, Lord. God, we thank you for mothers. Lord, we thank you for the mothers within grace life. What an excellent testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ they have been uh, to the world, Lord, to their own families. And though they do not know it, to me, God, to me, um, to see these women who faithfully, day in, day out, serve their husbands, raise their children, care for the needs of their household, Lord, serve the church. God, where would we be without them, Lord? Help us to not take them for granted. Lord, help us as men to appreciate our wives more. We have godly mothers to appreciate them more, Lord, to pray for them. God, to pray that You would give them wisdom and strength daily to carry out all the responsibilities that You have placed under their care, Lord. Lord, thank You for moms. God, I pray that You... Um, would encourage the mothers this morning. Lord, they live in a culture that wants to lie to them constantly, wants to belittle what they're doing, wants to, to describe it as cheap and mundane and, and boring, Lord. It's not, God. We've read in Proverbs 31, it is a virtuous and glorious thing that they have given their lives to, Lord. And it, and it does not go unnoticed in Your eyes, Father. Lord, I pray that You would encourage and strengthen the women, Lord, to be more faithful in their calling as mothers, Lord, so that their example would be a light that shines forth in this dark culture. 
God, help us, Lord. Bless the moms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one more announcement. I forgot. If it was a sign, it would have hit me in the face. Um, um, so the Byron Nelson is next week. I don't know the exact day, but if you don't know what the Byron Nelson is, it's a very big golf tournament. In McKinney, correct, brother? What does that mean? There's going to be a lot of people in McKinney at the golf course, and it would be a great opportunity, church, for us to go out, especially in light of the news that broke that the Supreme Court might be overturning Roe versus Wade. So it is on everybody's mind. It would be a great opportunity just to go out and to minister, to raise awareness to the community of what abortion is. And the easiest way you can do that, the reason I'm holding this sign is this is how easy it is. You can literally go out on the sidewalk and hold a sign. Just hold a sign. It's not difficult. So if you have time, I would ask you, encourage you to do that. Um, that it's not a fruitless labor. I don't know if y'all saw the news in Louisiana. Uh, the, the abolitionists that have been faithfully fighting against abortion. It's, it's a small movement. Think about how small it was. It was almost a fringe movement that the pro-lifers thought they were radical and they still do an extreme. But men and women who decided that they were going to stand upon God's Word and how they define these things, the Lord is beginning to bless that. In Louisiana, they I believe Anthony shared it was the first bill that passed through committee. And so just plodding along, to use Doug Wilson's words, just plowing putting your hand down and plowing and, and fighting for the unborn, the Lord will bring fruit to that work. Um, you will see fruit to that labor. And so church, doesn't matter what it is, holding a sign, preaching the gospel at the mill, going down to the legislators and speaking, no work is too small uh, for defending the most vulnerable amongst us, the unborn who cannot speak for themselves. And so I, I encourage you to find a way that you can just give some of your time at least once to serving in that capacity. And so, church, please stand as we recite our Scripture memory verse. It's Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. See, is it on the screen yet for y'all? Just one second. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. It says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Brother Jonathan is going to come do our Scripture reading and catechism question for this morning. All right, our catechism today. Question. What shall be done to the wicked at death? Church. The souls of the wicked shall at death be cast into the torments of hell, and their bodies lie in their graves till the resurrection and judgment of the great day. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. For our scripture reading today, we'll be beginning in verse 9 and going to the end of the chapter. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclose the dust of the earth in a measure, 
and weighted the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Who did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for, and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely they are, pl are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait, on, wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All right, I'm also leading singing today. So if we're going to be singing Psalm 2, it's in the 1650 Psalter app if you have that. I think the words should be on the screen as well. So let's... Uh, Let's lift our voices up to the Lord. Why rage the heathen and vain things? Why do the people mind? Kings of the earth to set themselves and princes are combined. To plot against the Lord and his anointed, saying thus, Let us asunder, break their bands, and cast their cords from us. He that in heaven sits shall laugh, the Lord shall scorn them all. Then shall he speak to them in wrath, in rage he vex them shall. Yet notwithstanding I have him to be my king appointed, and over 
Zion, holy hill, I have him, King anointed. The sure decree I will declare, the Lord has said to me, Thou art mine only Son this day, I have begotten Thee. Ask of me and for heritage the heathen I'll make thine, and for possession I to thee will give earth's utmost light. Thou shalt as with a weighty rod of iron break them all, and as a potter sure thou shalt them dash in pieces small. Now therefore, kings, be wise, be taught, ye judges of the earth. Serve God in fear and see that ye join trembling with your mirth. Kiss ye the sun, lest in his hour ye perish from the way. If once his wrath begin to burn, blessed all that on him stay. 143. Yes, 143. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. 
We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Brother in the back. I'm sorry, brother, I don't know that one. I will learn it. <laughs> brother. I'm sorry? 304? Sorry. <laughs> this one's a little off for me. I, I wish I knew that one. All right. 182. One eighty two is a Isaiah reading, brother. One eighty one. Okay. I don't know that one either. I'm gonna pick one eighty five. Here is love. <laughs> These are all really good hymns that I know that I need to learn, but they're all the ones that I'm not familiar with. I'm familiar with the old fundamentalist hymns. <laughs> so here is love vast as the ocean, hymn number 185. We're going to sing that one. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days on the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the flood gates of God's mercy float a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers born in and from above and has peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love let me all your love accepting love you ever all my days let me seek your kingdom only and my life be to your praise you alone shall be my glory nothing in the world i see you have cleansed and sanctified me you yourself have set me free. In your truth you still direct me by your spirit through your word. And your grace my need is meeting as I trust in you, my Lord. Of your fullness you are pouring your great love and power on me without measure full and boundless drawing out my heart to thee.
Hymn number 52. Dear refuge of my weary soul, this is not the indelible grace version. This one's um, an older tune, but it's very simple. Um, if you don't know it, you will by the fourth verse. <laughs> Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all my hopes decline. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust, and still my soul would cleave to thee, though prostrate in the dust. Hast thou not bid me seek thy face? And shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace Be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace Attends the mourner's prayer. Oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat With humble hope attend thy will And wait beneath thy feet Thy mercy seat is open still here let my soul retreat with humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Amen. I was going to hold one of those up, brother. <laughs> so as Corey said, the, the Byron Nelson is this week. I think they're having events out there every day. And um, 
I think Thursday is when the actual tournament starts. That's when there'll be even a greater uh, volume of people out there. But for those of you that haven't been out to the abortion mill in McKinney, literally it's close enough where you can see the practice range of that elite PGA golf course there. And across the street from the abortion mill, probably I mean, what three to three million dollar, five million dollar homes up. That's the type of neighborhood that this wickedness is being uh, perpetrated in. And so many of the people around there that we've talked to didn't know that that's what was going on there. So it's been very helpful. It, it's, a, it's a difficult place to actually be able to communicate with the women going in there just because the, the, the lack of access. But it's been very helpful in alerting the community to what's going on there right in their midst. And so I would encourage you, um, if, if you've never been out, hey, talk to me, talk to Will, talk to Corey, talk to Joe. Come out for an hour. Come out, hold, hold the sign, letting people know that that's what's happening right there in their midst in this exclusive area of McKinney. So just wanted to, to encourage you in that and give you some more details, you know, as to what that looks like. As Corey said, it, it's, it's literally that simple going out and holding a sign. And so I hope that you guys kind of saw that last weekend when we went out to the, to the mill in Dallas, that it's, this is not a difficult thing, but it's a thing that that the church is, has greatly neglected over the last 50 years. And so, as Corey said, praise God that, that maybe this is a true opinion, maybe it will hold, and that Roe is overturned. But what that means is that we have much more work to do to educate people why the pro-life laws that have been passed are failures in regard to upholding biblical justice. Because what will happen is if Roe really is overturned in Texas, what they call the trigger bill will go into effect that will, what they would say, abolish abortion. But what's going to happen is that, that mothers that kill their children are subject to zero penalties under that law. So the same thing that happened with the heartbeat bill, where now people, where mothers can, can take pills and basically kill their child that way, well, that will be happening in, in mass, and there, there's literally nothing that can be done about that under the current laws of Texas. And so what you have to do is you have to take out all those 50 years of pro-life laws and actually replace it with something that is biblical. And unfortunately, most Christians, most pro-life politicians have no idea what that looks like. And so, as Corey said, this is an opportunity where the, the awareness is up big time on this issue. So it gives us an opportunity to speak biblical truth, biblical justice into our society. So that's my, that's my mini sermon of the day, I guess. Uh, so, so we're continuing on um, in Galatians. We're coming to, to the end of this last chapter soon. Today we actually come to the final two verses in um, this, this um, exhortation portion of the letter. And so we're going to talk this morning about how we are not to grow weary. So the, the title of the sermon is Do Not Grow Weary. So many of you are probably familiar with the name David Brainerd. He was a missionary among the, um, the, 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 the Native Americans in the 1700s here in North America. And he wrote this just a few weeks into his ministry. He says, My soul is sunk. It seemed to me I should never have any success among the Indians. My soul was weary of this life. I longed for death beyond measure. So that was how ministry started out for David Brainerd. And then after two years, it wasn't any better. There was no improvement. He, at that point, said he felt his prospect of winning converts was as dark as midnight. But then the tide turned. After three years of ministry there, he finally witnessed a revival among the Indians of the Krawisung in New England. After another year and a half, the number of converts there numbered 150 among those Native American people. But in God's providence, David Brainerd died just five years into his ministry at the age of 29. After his death, the reason that you may have heard about David Brainerd was after his death, Jonathan Edwards actually took his diary and published it. And it was um, something that was widely read both in Europe and in America. And you're also probably familiar with this name, William Carey. He's called the, the, the father of modern missions. He was literally um, 
that, that, that first man that went out into the, to the peoples with the, with the true message of the gospel in the modern times. And it literally, he, he caused a stirring up of the people of God where men like, um, men like William, or not William Carey, men like David Livingston and um, Adoniram Judson followed after him. Hudson Taylor followed after him. And so what happened was that William Carey said that David Brainerd's journal was a key source of his inspiration for his missionary work. So here you have David Brainerd, just these few, few years among the, the Native Americans there, spurring on William Carey, spurring on the whole modern missions movement. And so David Brainerd wrote this in his journal in April, on April 17th, 1747. He said, Oh, I long to fill the remaining moments all for God. Though my body was so feeble and wearied with preaching and much, much private conversation, yet I wanted to sit up all night to do something for God. To God, the giver of these refreshments, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so what I want us to think about this morning is how can we be like, how can we imitate a man like David Brainerd who did not grow weary even in the midst of such trying and difficult circumstances. And so that's what I hope that we can pull out of the text this morning from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to begin reading our text and then we'll begin. So hear the inerrant, inspired, and infallible word of the Lord. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let's pray and ask for God's help as we open up His Word. Heavenly Father, we do come in the name of Christ. We come asking for Your help this morning. Lord, I pray that You would give me help in the preaching, give me clarity of mind, give me boldness in proclaiming the truth from Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would take this Word and do a work in each heart here this morning. Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient for us. Lord, I know many this morning, Lord, have felt that temptation even this week to grow weary. But I pray that, Lord, as the fountain of grace is open from your word, that it would be a refreshment to their souls. Lord, I ask all this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. So here is our outline for this morning. We're going to be looking at the temptation to grow weary. Then we're going to be looking at the hope of the harvest. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at the command to do good. So the temptation to grow weary, the hope of the harvest, and the command to do good. So we begin with the first part of verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. So when we look at Thayer's Greek definitions of the word there translated weary, what we see is it means to be utterly spiritless, to be wearied out, to be exhausted. And the complete word study dictionary helps us a little bit more. It says, in the New Testament, this was generally to be faint-hearted, to be faint, or to despond in view of trial and difficulty. Originally, it was used of something that had gone slack. So like a bow that had become unstrung. So that, that's what we... That's what God's word here is meaning by weary. Just you know, somebody that's that's just gone slack, totally deflated. And so, I want us to think: How many here, even maybe today, for sure this week, have been tempted with growing weary of doing good, growing weary in the Christian life? You know, wondering, Lord, am I going to be able to make it? to the end. So I think if we raise our hands, that would be many of us here this week that were faced with those thoughts. So what are some of the things that might tempt us to grow weary? Well, if you'll remember, as we turn that corner from chapter 5 to chapter 6, in chapter 5 we heard about the works of the flesh, we heard about the, the fruit of the Spirit. And as we came to chapter 6, Paul began some specific exhortations of what the fruit of the Spirit looked like, what it was like fleshed out within the Christian life. 
And so he gave us examples of what walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and keeping in step with the Spirit actually look like. And not some kind of vague thing, but okay, let's put this into practice in our lives, in the church. What does that look like? And so I think Paul is looking backward upon these last few verses at these areas of temptation that the Christians there in Galatia might be enticed to lose heart. And Paul is trying to spur them on to to press on in the faith. If you remember in verse 1, we saw that part of doing good meant restoring one that was caught in sin. And so we can be tempted to lose heart in those circumstances when that restoration doesn't happen as quickly as we think it should. Because we convince ourselves in our own minds, well, we always repent completely and immediately. That's what it looks like for us. But we see this other brother or sister not doing that. And so we can be tempted to grow weary. And then we can be tempted to grow faint when that person that you're trying to restore is actually fighting against you in that restoration. Right? It can be very discouraging to receive opposition from someone that you're trying to help. I think probably all the parents in here could give an amen to that, right? I mean, I mean, it can be discouraging when you feel like, man, I'm just trying to, by God's grace, help my children, and they're kicking and fighting against that. So we can be tempted to grow weary. So we can also be tempted to grow weary when this brother or sister that we're trying to restore has actually fallen into the same sin before. And we think, man, why can't they be like me? I never sin in the same way twice. I mean, we, we deceive ourselves and we can be tempted to grow weary. And in verse 2, we saw that doing good includes bearing one another's burdens. So things like persecution, financial difficulties, sickness, family difficulties, the loss of a job, worry, doubt, loneliness, or basically any kind of hardship that we can be tempted to buckle under. Those are the types of things that we were supposed to bear in one another's lives. And so, we can be tempted in those circumstances, right? When someone needs help, because we convince ourselves, I don't ever need help from anybody, right? We, We convince ourselves, okay, I'm the perfect Lone Ranger Christian. I can just do this thing all by myself. And if that's how you think the Lord will will quickly humble you, that that, that's part of why you've been placed in a church among the people of God to to help bearing those burdens. And remember, what did Paul describe bearing burdens in such a way as? He said it was fulfilling the law of Christ. So, as we strive to obey God's commands, to be Christ-like in those circumstances that require time and resources from us. These things are not easy. It can leave us physically, spiritually, emotionally depleted and we can be tempted to grow weary. And in verse 5, we saw that we're to bear our own load, which means that we're to be faithful in meeting our own obligations. We're to be faithful in fulfilling our own responsibilities personally in our marriages, in our home, in our workplaces, in the church. So we looked at how, yes, if you're in need, you should be able to rejoice that God has given the means in your family and in the church to be able to help you, but you shouldn't be looking to that help unnecessarily. You should be striving to, to, to work, to provide for yourself, provide for your own household. And then we saw when we came to verse 6 that not only are we to strive to provide for our own household, not only are we to strive to be bearing one another's burdens, but we're also to be striving to provide financially for the leaders in the church. As Paul said, share all good things with the one who teaches. And those are just a few examples of the calling of the Christian life. And if you're like me, just hearing those things, you can be tempted to grow weary and think, Lord, can I really do that? Can I really finish the race? And so, when we hear this term, doing good, this is not some kind of nebulous 
term that you can just take and fill that with whatever you want. As I said, in, in the context here, I think it's synonymous with fulfilling the law of Christ. Which if you remember when I preached on that text, that that wasn't just some nebulous term either, right? That fulfilling the law of Christ was really fulfilling the first and second great commandments. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And then that being fleshed out more in the remaining commandments of God. And so, you could think about, okay, how do I know what doing good looks like? Well, you can look to the commandments of God or you can look to the Christ of God who fulfilled those commandments perfectly. That's what doing good in your life looks like. But it wasn't just the Galatians that would be tempted to lose heart. We see Christ in His earthly ministry giving His disciples a parable that would encourage them not to lose heart when they pray. This is Luke 18, verse 1. And He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And then Paul tells the church at Ephesus not to lose heart at the suffering that he was facing. Ephesians 3.13 So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. And then... Paul gives the church at Thessalonica the exact same exhortation that he gives the Galatians. He says, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And so, it's a normal temptation in the human life, in the Christian experience, to be tempted to grow weary, to be tempted to lose heart. Calvin summarized it this way. He said, This precept is especially necessary because we are naturally lazy in the duties of love, and many little stumbling blocks hinder and put off even the well-disposed. We meet with many unworthy, ungrateful people. The vast number of the needy overwhelms us. We are drained by paying out on every side. Our warmth is dampened by the coldness of others. Finally, the whole world is full of hindrances which turn us from the right path. Therefore, Paul does well to confirm our efforts so that we do not grow faint through weariness. And so that can be the temptation for us all to grow weary in the Christian life. There's so many hindrances that come in, so many stumbling blocks that will tempt us toward that. So what's the motivation and what's the hope that Paul gives here to the Galatians about this temptation to weariness and their enticement to lose heart well we come to the second half of verse 9 and that hope is the hope of the harvest so the hope of the harvest so verse 9 continues for in due season we will reap if we do not give up so if you'll remember a few weeks ago this this turns us back to those preceding verses in verses 7 through 8 we heard do not be deceived god is not mocked for whatever one sows that will he also reap for the one who sows to his flesh will reap from the flesh and reap from, from the flesh reap corruption but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life and so we see here Paul is grounding this exhortation to not grow weary in an eschatological hope an eschatological reward so Paul here is looking forward to the last day looking forward to the final judgment so when he says in due season, you could translate it in the proper season or in God's own time. That is, that is what we're looking forward to. And so, if you sow doing good, you will reap treasures in heaven. That's ultimately what Paul is pointing toward here. And so, again, we have to remember that doing good is not some kind of nebulous thing. This is what Paul means by living a life worthy of the Gospel. Walking by the Spirit. Keeping in step by the Spirit. Or keeping the commands of God. And so, doing good in that sense in this life results in rewards in the life to come. And so when I say that, hopefully all of us here as Christians understand what I mean by that. I don't mean that you can go out and do good works to, to merit favor before God. 
Like we have to understand the separation between justification over here and sanctification over here. Here we're speaking of living the sanctified Christian life. Over here in justification, you cannot do enough to merit right standing before God. God says your very best that you're going to bring to Him on your own are like filthy rags. So you're without hope if you think you can merit favor before a holy God. That is why Christ had to come. It wasn't an option. Christ came living the perfect life that we could never live, taking the wrath of a holy and just God upon Himself on behalf of His people. And so when we come in repentance and faith, Christ's righteousness is credited to us. Our sin is imputed to Him. And so God sees us as completely righteous. And now as people credited with that perfect righteousness, given a new heart with new desires, we can actually live out the Christian life and by doing good, then store up treasures in heaven. So as we looked at in verses 7 and 8, there, there's this, this eschatological hope at the end of this that Paul is looking forward to, but also there are principles in Scripture about the benefits of doing good in this life. So we talked about how, yes, there are wicked people, disobedient to God's Word, that prosper in this life, but that's not the norm. And we talked about how there can be Christians, Christians that actually live like Christians. There's lots of people that, that name the name of Christ. There might actually even be true Christians that don't live like Christians. But for a Christian that actually lives like a Christian, who lives a godly life, who works hard, who makes wise financial decisions, who saves and invests, who disciples his family, there will be times where that person doesn't prosper in this life. But that's not the norm. What we see in, in Proverbs and other places are general principles pointing forward to the, the benefit of doing good in this life. And then we know that we serve a sovereign God who providentially brings those circumstances about. Even those things that we might look at and go, that's bad, that's unjust. Well, God is using all of those circumstances for our good and for His glory. That's the, the, the power of the God that we serve. And so, even when those things are going against those general principles, God's taking that and using them to make you more into the image of Christ. So even when you don't get what you want, God's still using that to make you more into the image of the Son. And so, that should be a motivation for us brothers and sisters to not grow weary in doing good. We see Paul basically making this exact connection when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And it, the, the, the phrase is, when you see therefore in Scripture, you have to ask what it's there for, right? So, hey, we, like, let's go back and look at the preceding verse. What is Paul talking about that, that will cause us not to lose heart? Well, the preceding verse is back in the chapter before then, in it's chapter 2, verses, um, verse 318. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, for those of us in Christ, that is one of the reasons for us not to lose hope that all of us in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, are being transformed from one glory to another, made more into the image of Christ. So not one of us in this room in Christ is left out of that promise. If you are in Him, that is certainly what is happening to you, even though you may not have the eyes of faith to see it, that He is working in you, making you more into the image of His Son. And so, in a sense, we would like to be like the farmer, right? The farmer wants to plant some corn. Well, he, he knows the timing. He knows how corn works. Okay, I, 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 you till the field, I put the corn in at this time. Well, sometime, you know, let's say three months, six months later, that's going to be about when you have a harvest of corn, right? You, you can see this connection. I mean, otherwise farming wouldn't work very well. Um, so so there, there's this connection. and we, we want that in the Christian life, right? We want to be able to see, okay, Lord, how, how is this thing over here that we're sowing? How is that working in, in this reaping? And what God says most of the time is you don't get to know that Christian. What God says, I'm going to give you these promises and I want you to obey me, obey what my word says, and then trust me in the harvest that's going to come. Remember earlier we talked about David Brainerd 
you know, who ministered among the Native Americans in North America. Well, he was that man that was such an inspiration to William Carey. Well, when we, we look at William Carey's life, what we see is that in 1793, he began his ministry there in India. He faithfully preached the gospel for seven years there. And you know how many converts he had? Zero. Seven years ministering the gospel there. Not one person gets saved. Do you think that he was tempted to grow weary? you think he was tempted to lose heart? Like, Lord, why do you have me here amongst these people? But he felt called. He pressed on. And here's what he wrote in those early years of ministry. He said, I feel as a farmer does about his crop. Sometimes I think the seed is springing, and thus I hope. A little blast all, and my hopes are gone like a cloud. They were only weeds which appeared. And if a little corn sprung up, it quickly dies, being either choked with weeds or parched up by the sun of persecution. Yet I still hope in God, and I will go forth in His strength and make mention of His righteousness, even of His only. And so that was the hope that William Carey had. Then it was seven years into that ministry on December 28, 1800, that he baptized his first Hindu convert, a man named Krishna Paul. Then he went on to 41 years of ministry there, seeing about 700 people come to Christ. Which, that's glorious. 700 souls ushered into the kingdom out of how many people in India, though? I mean, millions. Hundreds of millions, probably, even at that point in India. So, by the world standard, that may seem small. But, as I said earlier, William Carey actually inspired the modern missions movement. And men like... Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, David Livingston, and and literally thousands of others followed in his footsteps. And so, here we end up with literally the Gospel being taken to the ends of the earth. And and in this context, go back to David Brainerd, who in the mid-1700s ministered there for five years among the Native Americans. Three years until he saw the first person come to Christ. And then dies after five years of ministry there at the age of 29. And then him inspiring William Carey, who labors there in India for seven years without a convert. For 41 years. At a time where the average Englishman that went to India to live out in the rural areas would live six months because of the conditions there. But yet, William Carey lives 41 years and inspired a generation of missionaries. So William Carey inspired by the work of David Brainerd and then William Carey inspiring literally thousands of missionaries throughout the world. And so, David Brainerd would have no idea Right? Obviously, God's sovereign. This, this is you, to all praise and glory to God, but yet that the Lord would work through David Brainerd, oh, those many years ago amongst the Native American people, through Jonathan Edwards publishing his biography or his, his journal, through William Carey seeing and, and reading that and being spurred in, in his call to evangelism and thus inspiring the whole world for Christ. It, it's amazing. And so. It helps us to see that we don't know how God will use us, will use our efforts for future generations, right? David, David Brenner had no idea how God would use those things. And I'm sure at the end of his life, there, there was some sense where, like, man, I'm dying at 29, Lord. I, I, I thought there was so much more. I've seen this fruit here amongst these people. But... Here, now that we look back, you know, 200 years, 300 years later, we see the magnificent fruit of that faithfulness to God. We see this reminder that we are to faithfully obey what God has said and trust Him 
with the results. So here's another illustration of a man named Luke Short who was saved at the age of 103. Which, if you've been a Christian very long, you know that doesn't happen very much to have a man saved you know, in his later years that way. And he was saved by remembering a sermon that he had once heard preached by the famous Puritan John Flavel. So he heard Flavel's sermon, meditating upon it later at the age of 103, calls out to Christ and gets saved. On his tombstone, when he died three years later, it had this inscription, Here lies a babe in grace, aged three years, who died according to nature, aged 106. So that's a pretty amazing story, right? But you don't even know the most amazing part yet. That man, Luke Short, actually heard that sermon preached by John Flavel when he was 18 years old. 85 years before he gets saved. And then at the age of 103, is remembering, meditating upon that, and the hound of heaven comes and gets him and saves him. So the Gospel that was sowed almost a century before it is reaped in good season at God's perfect timing. And so, I know for us, we go share the Gospel with someone and what do we want? We want that person to, to turn like the Philippian jailer, right? And ask, what do I have to do to be saved? Right? But most of the time, that's not going to happen. But we have illustrations like this in Scripture. We have illustrations in church history that tells us, Christian, you don't know how God is using these things. And so just trust Him and obey. So John Brown summarized it this way. He said, Every act of Christian duty, every sacrifice made, every privation submitted to, every suffering endured, from a regard to Christ's authority with a view to Christ's honor shall surely be recompensed. And so, that is the promise, Christian, that that if you're doing good in the name of Christ, seeking His glory, that that it will be recompensed. Not in maybe the way that you think, not in the timing that you want, but in God's perfect timing. And so, with today being Mother's Day, I thought that that is a a poignant reminder to all the moms out there that you can't see how God is working in your children's lives. You can't see how God is working in your children's hearts. And so we can't see how our actions, we can't see how our words impact them. I mean, we're the same as the evangelist, right? We want results immediately. You know, we want to see a perfect heart change, perfect obedience in our children. But we can't see not only how our actions will impact them, we can't see how our actions, how our words, how we disciple them is going to impact generations to come. I mean, the truth is, you've been impacted many, many ways by your parents, by your grandparents, by your great-grandparents that you don't even know in God's providence, all those things. And none of us will know those things till we get to glory. But, mothers, this is a reminder that that you serve a faithful God and that in His perfect timing, you will reap from the things that you're sowing. But it'll, it'll rarely be in the time and in the manner that you would choose. And so, it's a reminder for you, press on. You serve a trustworthy and steadfast God. And in due season, you will reap. The Puritan John Flavel that we just mentioned earlier, he said this, he says, Providence is wiser than you. And you may be confident that it has suited all things better to your eternal good than you could do had you been left to your own option. That's hard for us to believe, right? That God's providence is actually wiser than us. I mean, we... We plan our day, we plan our weeks, we plan our months, we plan our years, and when it doesn't go according to what we had planned, we can be frustrated, we can be tempted, we can be tempted to grow weary. But that's when we have to remember this truth that God's providence is wiser than you. He's ordained all these things from the foundation of the world for your good and for his glory. And so that 
is the hope of the harvest. And that brings us to our last point in verse 10, the command to do good. So verse 10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we've had two negatives so far in verse 9. Do not grow weary. Do not give up. And as I mentioned, we're coming here to the conclusion of the letter. We're coming um, next time we'll be into kind of the conclusion of the letter. And we'll probably spend at least a few weeks there. But we're coming now to the end of this teaching and exhortation section of this letter. And so he ends all of this with this positive command for us. Christian, do good. Let us do good. And again... It's not some kind of fuzzy thing what this means. He, he's saying, Christian, I've told you this. Walk by the Spirit. Christian, I've told you this. Live by the Spirit. Bear the fruit of the Spirit. Live according, or, or um, walk in the law of Christ. Basically, he's saying, do good to everyone. Love everyone as I have loved you. That's the new commandment that we see in John 13. And Paul says, as we have opportunity. In the Greek, it's, it's actually the same word opportunity here that is translated season in verse 9. And so there's a connection there that we don't readily see. And so what Paul's saying is, well, just as reaping will come in due season at the proper time, so we must make use of this time that we have now to be sowing to the Spirit rather than sowing to the flesh. And so, saints, he wants us to see that the final judgment is coming. And he wants us to purpose to do good in this life as long as God grants us breath in our lungs to do so. So the world thinks this way. Life is short. And so, so what's their mindset? We just need to eat, drink, and be merry. And what Paul wants us to see is, yes, life is short but we need to be busy about doing good in that vapor of time that God has given us on this earth. We need to be glorifying God. We need to be advancing His kingdom. And so, Paul's not writing that to have you be anxious about that or to have you feel guilty about what, okay, have I done enough good for God? That's not Paul's intent. What Paul is intending here is to encourage you, to motivate you in light of all this truth about sowing and reaping. Now, Christian, go do good. That God will bring the blessing of that in His due time. So you just put your hand to the plow, do good, and trust Him. So what we see by that is the good that we do in this life will outlive this life and come with us into the life to come. You've probably heard someone say something like this, you know, that, that a hearse doesn't have a trailer hitch on the back. Or that you know, a hearse does, you'll never see a U-Haul following behind a hearse. Right? In those sorts of analogies, people are trying to help us to see, well, you can't take the things of this world with you. Right? No matter how much you know, worldly wealth and things that you accumulate, hey, that's, that's not coming with you over into glory. But here's what Christ said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. He said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So don't be laying up treasures that are going to fit in that U haul. But what does Christ say? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys, but where thieves do not break in and steal. So, you can think about it this way. You can't take the earthly treasures with you, but you can send heavenly treasures on ahead of you in advance. I think that's, that's what Christ is communicating for us there. So here in this verse, we have both a universal call, a universal ethic, and, and a specific ethic. This universal ethic is do good to everyone. So you could think about it this way. 
all people, all tongues, all tribes, all nations, every single one made into the image of God, and so do good to them. So who's left out of that? No one. Doesn't matter that hey, you don't like this particular person, you don't like these particular people. Doesn't matter. Do good to everyone, Christian. And then there's a specific ethic, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So there we see this, this broad principle, right? But there's a, a more laser focused call to that. That the focus of our doing good, our time, our talent, our treasure, is to be the people of God. Spurgeon said this, he says, they have a first claim upon us. They are our nearest kin. They are our brethren in Christ. Extend your love, your charity to all mankind, but let the center of that circle be in the home where God has placed you, in the home of His people. And so, those of us that are in Christ, we share in the promises of God. Those of us in Christ, we share in the redeeming blood of our Savior. Those of us in Christ will spend eternity together in glory. And so, those in Christ ought to have a greater claim upon our affections and upon our aid than even blood relative family members. I would say that those in Christ have the greatest claim upon our hearts and upon our help. And I would hone that down a little more and I would say that's particularly true amongst this local body of believers. Those of us that have covenanted in Christ together. So we have this general principle, do good to everybody. Hone it down a little more. Do good to Christians. And then get it down to, to the finest point. Do good to those here within this local church, this local manifestation of God's people. And so, just to summarize everything that we've heard from this, I would say, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary. Do not be attempted, or do not be tempted to quit. Finish the race. Press on by the power of the Spirit living in you. Press on and finish this race. Fight the good fight of faith. Believe in the promises of God. Rest in those promises that there is the hope of the harvest that in due season you will reap. So stay the course. Plot on. As you have opportunity, do good to everyone, but especially those of the household of faith and especially those of this household of faith. So let me end just with reading a few verses from our Scripture reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 40. This is verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come confessing, Lord, that temptation to grow weary, that temptation to think that we may not even finish this race that you've put before us. Lord, we thank You for the promises in Your Word. We thank You for the examples in Your Word of those people that have persevered. We thank You for those people in church history that we can look back on and see their faithfulness and see how You've brought reaping from those things that were sowed. Lord, I pray that You would help us to set our eyes upon Christ today. I pray that we would not grow weary. Lord, I pray that anyone here that has been tempted to that, that they would just find their fret there. Um, faith renewed once again, that they would set their eyes upon the Savior, Lord, and that they would put their hand to the plow, that they would press on, that they would trust You and Your promises, and that they would obey the truth from Your Word and do good to all as they have opportunity. Lord, I pray all this in Christ's name and for His glory. Amen.
Men, you are dismissed saints.